Hey everyone, welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. My name is Kate, and this is the second video in my series on Roman weddings. Last time I talked about what a wedding would have been like for the bride herself, since like today, although for different reasons, the wedding was all about the bride. Today we're going to look at a very famous poem from the late Republican period about Roman weddings, uh, Catullus number 61. And through that poem, we're going to look at some of the events that would have taken place on the wedding day leading up to the wedding day, uh, and what sorts of things you might expect to see if you were going to attend a Roman wedding through looking at the lines of this poem. So I'm not going to say too much by way of introduction because this is kind of a longer episode. Uh, it's a really long poem and I wanted to get as much information about it as I could into the video, so bear with me if it's a little bit longer than my usual content. I've broken it up into chapters, which you can find in the description below if you want to jump around to a specific timestamp, but otherwise that's about all I have to say by way of introduction. Like I said last time, if you haven't seen that video yet, I recorded these videos before I got married, and I am now married, so I'm posting them after the fact, so you're gonna hear me say things like, when I get married in the future, but just understand that that is all irrelevant at this point because I'm already married. So with that, I will turn you over to past Kate to learn all about Catullus and his wedding poem. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Catullus's work, Catullus was a lyric poet writing at the end of the Roman Republican period. He died in 54 BC. And we have his work in a collection that's just called the Carmina, or the Songs, and they don't have individual titles, they're just numbered. The poem that we're looking at today is Catullus number 61. Like I said in the introduction, this kind of goes through a bunch of different events that would have occurred at a Roman wedding, but because our sources are so sparse and so varied in what they report, it's hard for us to put together a definitive sequence of events that would have happened at a Roman wedding. And that makes sense if you think about today, there are customs that are very popular, like having a wedding cake. But the last wedding I went to a few weeks ago, there was no wedding cake. They did cupcakes. So, you know, just because something is a custom in ancient Rome doesn't mean that every single person would have done that for their wedding. And the other disclaimer I'll say before we get started, I said this in the last video, our sources primarily report on the experiences that they've had in their own lives and the people that they're directly in contact with. When we're talking about literary sources, we are primarily talking about the upper class, the aristocracy. So this is not what Roman weddings would have looked like in every city, in the countryside, you know, people in, in every different financial situation. These are just some ideas about what a Roman wedding would have looked like. So what was the purpose of a marriage for a Roman aristocrat? That seems kind of silly as a question. We think about, you know, what is the purpose of a marriage? Well, isn't it obvious two people fall in love and they get married? That may be true for us today, but that's not how it was in antiquity, especially, like I said, for aristocrats. Marriages oftentimes were political arrangements between two families or a way for two families to join their forces and create a stronger and better situation for themselves financially in terms of land holdings and whatever else. When things between Julius Caesar and Pompey Magnus were starting to go a little sour, Caesar said, let me offer my daughter to Pompey in marriage to solidify our alliance further. And when Pompey's wife, Julia, eventually died in childbirth, uh, which was a very traumatic experience for Pompey by all accounts, 
uh, it was really important for Caesar to try and arrange a marriage again with another girl in his family in order to keep that political alliance afloat, which of course did not happen, but he tried. And so this is something that we don't necessarily think about in our own culture today. I mean, arranged marriages, yes, they still exist, and a lot of people have really good experiences with that, and a lot of people, you know, just grow up that way, that's their culture. But we don't necessarily think about, you know, I need to marry my daughter off to this other guy because we're colleagues in the House of Representatives. That's just not how weddings work in, at least in America, which is what I can speak for. And so because these marriages were arranged by the families, it was either typically the father of the bride and the groom would have a discussion, the father of the bride and the father of the groom might have a discussion, it could even be the whole family. Presumably the couple would have had some input, but because these were prearranged, Naturally, the process of getting engaged looked a little bit different than renting out a football stadium and putting it up on the Jumbotron. This would have been an agreement, as I said, between a few families that would have laid out all the details when this is going to happen. Uh, the groom had a lot of input, by all accounts, on when the actual wedding day would occur, and there would be some kind of exchange of a dowry in some form or another. Choosing a date for a wedding would have been very important and a little bit challenging because there were a lot of days that were considered unlucky or inauspicious to get married on. In each month, the calends, the nones, and the ides would have been considered inauspicious and even the days following them. These days each month were religious days, they were sacred to different gods, and it was unlucky to get married on these days because it's not a good idea to commit violence on a religious day. And if you're thinking, well, how could a wedding be violent? I'd encourage you to watch the last video that I did on this topic because it was a very different experience and there was this notion, real or pretend, of violence done against the bride herself. They had like a false kidnapping ritual. It was like a whole thing. So yeah, weddings were considered to be violent. And also, I didn't get into this in the last video because I don't feel like talking about it, but there was this sort of uh, insistence that if a bride was properly pure on her wedding night, uh, there would be bleeding, uh, so that's violent. So yeah, these days were not prohibited like in the eyes of the law, but culturally were unlucky to get married on. Religiously were unlucky to get married on. Although if you're marrying a widow who is necessarily not virginal, then it's okay to get married on one of these days, of course. Other unlucky days were any days that were associated with the dead in any form. So all of these days right here would have been unlucky to get married on. I have to admit, I was a little bit nervous writing this list. I was hoping my wedding date wouldn't pop up, but I think we're good, we're good. Because the Lemuria festival was hosted during May and actually for several non-consecutive days in May, the entire month of May was considered unlucky because this was like the primary festival for the unfriendly spirits that you want to get out of your house. There's a lot of supernatural activity going on in May in general, right? So there's a lot of spookiness happening and you don't want to get married during the month of May. So sorry to all of you who have May wedding anniversaries. It was also considered unlucky to get married in the beginning of June because that's when Vesta's temple was being cleaned out for the Westalia festival and everything was being prepared in honor of her, so it was considered bad form to get married during this time as well. It was also common courtesy and a pretty good idea to avoid getting married on days that were the anniversaries of historical military disasters. 
If you are around my age or older, you might remember what it was like after 9-11. I remember I was a kid when 9-11 happened, uh, old enough to remember it. And I just remember the first time I heard that someone had a birthday on 9-11 and I was like, ooh, that's a bad birthday, you know? But it, it does have this kind of psychological effect, right? Where you're like, oh, you got married on Pearl Harbor Day, that's a choice, that is a choice, you know, so it was like that in Rome as well. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that no weddings happen during these months. Later periods, we have a lot of, like, Christian epitaphs, and it seems like December, January, and May, incidentally, were the most popular months for marriages. So that says that even though there are scruples about these kinds of things, everything is flexible. I'm also being wild and free with chronology here because our sources are so limited. So once the wedding was arranged, everything was decided, all the preparations were made, it came time for the big day. So let's turn to Catullus 61 now and talk about what some of those events would have looked like. Just a little bit about the poem before we get started. This is an epithalamion, which is a wedding song or a wedding poem. The word itself comes from ancient Greek, epi meaning near, nearby, approaching, and the thalamos was the Greek word for bed. So these are poems or songs that are meant to be sung as you are approaching, whether physically or metaphorically, approaching the marriage bed. The marriage bed itself was an important symbol, not only of the, I guess, metaphysical and physical connection between the couple, the union of the pair, but also the promise of bearing future children, which was one of the main purposes for marriage in the first place. So that's why this poem is called an epithalamion. It's written in glyconic meter. Uh, I don't really know too much about this meter, but I will put how it's supposed to go up here for anybody who likes to scan, um, and I will just leave you with that. So I'm going to be using my translation of this poem and all of my notes on it. Um, I have posted this on my website if you want to follow along with me, but I'll try to put as much of it on the screen as I feel like I can. And yeah, that's it. Um, it, I should just point out, this was meant to be enjoyed as a song. Uh, this was not meant to be dry poetry. Even the way that I'm translating it is a little bit more dry than it would have been. It, it was meant to be fun, it was meant to be exciting. I didn't really have time to produce, like, a super fancy translation. This is a utility translation, so... Uh, as I'm going through this, just understand that it's meant to be lyrically beautiful. The first stanza starts off, O keeper of the Heliconian hill, kin of Urania, you who carry off a delicate virgin to a husband. And then we get an invocation of the god that he's talking about, O Hymene Hymen, O Hymen Hymene. Hymen is the son of Urania, who is one of the Muses. The Muses live on Mount Helicon, which is in Boeotia, so that's why we get all of this sort of introductory keeper of the Heliconian Hill, kin of Urania. After the invocation, when the poem really gets started, we immediately turn to the bride. Crown your temples with flowers, sweet-smelling marjoram, take the flammeum, Come happily to this place, here wearing your yellow shoe on a fair foot. These are all references to what Roman brides would have worn. The flammeum is the most iconic piece of Roman bridal costume, and that is the veil. Um, it would have been probably dyed uh, either like a yellow or an orange, even a pink, and the shoes to match it, although this poem is the only reference to those shoes. So at the beginning of the poem, the bride is preparing herself for the day. She is at her 
familial home. Her family members are there. They're doing her very elaborate hairstyle. It's possible and even probable that her mother might have been the one doing this hairstyle. This would have been happening at the start of the day. Also at the bride's house, there may have been some omens taken. Cicero complains in his day that people are still inviting diviners to their weddings even though nobody takes omens anymore, but it presumably omens would have been taken in a lot of cases, even in Cicero's day, and I would argue long after Cicero's day. It's possible also that the bride would have offered some kind of sacrifice there before she left, um, some kind of bloodless offering of, you know, wine or water and barley maybe, not entirely sure. And then once the bride is ready to go, we can begin the main portion of the wedding, which is the procession. This has a practical element to it, so you need to get the bride from her childhood home to her new home as a married woman living with her husband and his family. There would have been lots of people in attendance and actually people from the street could just join in. If you saw a wedding party that was going down the street, why not just jump in and sing along with them? There would have been music, dancing, lots of joking around, lots of fun and stirred up by the happy nuptial day, sing a chorus of wedding songs with your ringing voice. Strike the ground with your feet. With your hand, shake the pine torch. So again, you have songs, dancing, marching, walking along, and there's also the presence of torches. We don't necessarily know what the function of torches was at a wedding. Uh, it could have been practical if this was happening in the evening. It could have been a way to light your path. I mean, there's no street lights. You're not in a car that has headlights. You'd have to see where you're going. So that's one possibility. It's also possible that there was some kind of purification ritual where the bride or the groom or both would have had to touch fire and water to purify themselves. Maybe that had something to do with it. And it could also be symbolic. Fire symbolizes not only passion, right? L love, whatever, eroticism, but also uh, fire is a life-bringing element. Uh, the myth of Prometheus brought fire to humans. It m made human society possible. So it could also be expressing a hope for future life to come out of this union. And then we get the names of the people that this poem is actually dedicated to. For Vinia to Manlius, just like Venus, when she was showing favor to Ida, came to the Phrygian judge, the good virgin is wed with good omens. So we have the name of the bride, Vinia, Winia, and we have the name of the groom, Manlius. And then we get a nice little reference to the judgment of Paris. So this Phrygian judge that Catullus is talking about is Paris of Troy. The good virgin is wed with good omens. Like I said, omens would have been taken and throughout the day we'll see more times when that comes up. Shining like Asian myrtle with its flowering branches, which the Hamadryad goddesses cultivate for their pleasure with rosy dew. So this is all praise of how beautiful and wonderful the bride is. And so come on, march to this place, bring your approach. Leave the Aeonian caves of the Thespian rock, above which the frigid stream of the nymph Aganipe flows. So this is addressing Hymen directly, encouraging the god to come down and grace the wedding with his presence. And call home the lady wanting a new husband, binding the mind with love, just like a tender vine encircles a tree, wandering here and there. And at the same time, you, intact virgins, for whom an equal day comes, lead in the meter, say, O oh, Hymenae Hymen, O oh, Hymen Hymenae. Let me get my Latin here. Um, ah, uh, the word is integri which can mean whole, complete, full, but I'm using the word intact here for what I think are probably obvious reasons. So he's saying, you girls go ahead and sing this, so that when he hears himself called to duty, more easily, more quickly, he might bring his approach, the leader of good Venus, the joiner of good love. 
Now we get a long praise section for Hymen, which I'll run through very, very briefly. I don't have a ton to say about this. What god is sought more by anxious lovers? Whom of the sky do men worship more? O Hymenae Hymen, O Hymen Hymenae. The trembling parent calls you to their children. For you, virgins loose the belt on their lap. For you, the shy new husband listens with desirous ear. So here he's saying, for you, virgins loose the belt on their lap. So this is a reference to the special belt that brides wore, uh, which was tied with what we would call a square knot, but was in antiquity referred to as a Hercules knot. This symbolized eternal love and fidelity, and only the groom was allowed to remove it. You yourself, he's still talking about the god Hymen, you yourself give a flowering little girl into the hand of a wild youth from the lap of her mother. O oh, Hymen A Hymen, O oh, Hymen Hymen A. The word here is puelulam, which is the diminutive of puella. So the word puella means a girl, uh, specifically like a child, like a, a, a girl child. This was not used to describe adult women, uh, as far as I know, basically at all. And to take that word and make it even smaller, put a diminutive on it, that little, like, instead of puella, it's puellula, um, that means it's a little girl. Uh, there's, for some reason, an emphasis on her very, very, very young age. In a way, it's balanced out by the word ueni. Uh, so a uenus or a uentus is a youth. This was like an adolescent boy. I don't know, I get creeped out by the use of this word here. Um, but it's true, you know, Roman girls married a, a lot younger than uh, we do today. Then we get more praise of Hymen. Venus can't do anything suitable without you, anything which a good reputation allows. But she can if you're willing. Who dared to be compared to this god? People are going to do what they're going to do, and Venus is at work whether Hymen is there or not. But Hymen lends a sort of credibility to what Venus provides uh, for people, which is lust and sexual encounters. For Venus's work to be considered legitimate, there needs to be the addition of this other god to sanctify the whole thing through marriage. Without you, no house can bear children, nor can a parent lean on his offspring. But with you, it's possible. Who dared to be compared to this god? Without you, no land can give protection to its sacred boundaries, but it can with you willing. Who dared to be compared to this god? This stanza is a little bit uh, interesting. I found a reference in the commentary. So I'm putting a link to the Latin version of this in the description, and it's on Perseus. There's also a commentary right there. Super useful. Um, apparently, what this stanza is referencing is the fact that in early Roman law, only Roman citizens were allowed to join the legions. And the only way that you could be a Roman citizen was if you were born legitimately through proper Roman marriage and all of that. So in order to join the legions, your parents had to be married, which means that Hymen had to be involved in that situation. Therefore, Rome can't protect its borders without this god. He's ostensibly a wedding god, but he's also got this kind of protective element. He's protecting Roman culture, in a sense. All right, at this point in the procession, they have reached the groom's house. It was apparently a very short walk. So Catullus says, Open the lock on the door. The virgin is here. Don't you see how the torches shake their shining locks? And then, unfortunately, we're missing two lines here. But already we've seen, I mean, I'm, I'm not even halfway through this poem, and how many times have we heard about virginity already? She's stressed as a virginal figure over and over and over again. And yet in this moment, as you'll see in just a second, we are about to turn to a lengthy discussion of the consummation of the marriage. So it just causes this kind of striking contrast between 
her current status and her identity, who she is, and what we are about to see uh, in the rest of this poem. All right, let's read some more. I'm going to read a longer passage this time. Inborn modesty lingers. Nevertheless, when she hears this more, this meaning whatever was in the two missing lines, I guess, she cries because it's necessary to go. Stop crying. There's no danger for you, Arunculea. No woman more beautiful than you sees a clear day coming from Oceanus. Just as a hyacinth flower is accustomed to stand in the variegated little garden of a wealthy master. But you delay. The day is leaving. Go forth, new bride. Go forth, new bride, if now it seems right, and let you hear our words. See how the torches shake their golden locks? Go forth, new bride. As soon as we reach the groom's house, instead of this being a happy occasion, we're hearing how the bride is crying because she doesn't want to go. So what's that about? Well, first of all, again, if you've seen the last video that I did, this would have been a very shocking and perhaps traumatic time for a girl. However, this is not what Catullus is talking about. Catullus is talking about something very specific. It was considered more auspicious and generally better if a bride was upset on her wedding day, so a lot of times even fake tears would have been shed and she would have been expected to show lots of negative emotions. The more emotional and terrified and horrified she was, the better. Additionally, uh, there's also a ritual that I am calling the abduction pageant. So this is referenced by Festus. Basically, there was a point in the wedding procession where someone, uh, actually probably not the groom, but someone else would pretend to kidnap the bride and forcibly bring her into her husband's house, into her new husband's house. Now, why on earth would they do this? Well, there's a story from Rome's early mytho-history about this very thing. When Romulus was setting up his new city, he had everything all set and it was all great, except that it was all men, which meant that whatever they did was guaranteed to only last for their generation and not go any further. And so they started petitioning the neighboring settlements for the right to intermarry, and they were refused for various reasons. And so Romulus came up with the clever idea to just kidnap a bunch of wives for his guys. So they set up this whole fake festival and they invited everybody in, and then they actually, you know, somebody gave the signal and then they started snatching women and carrying them off. If you ask Plutarch, he'll tell you that, well, you know, the Sabine incident, right, because the primary settlement where the women came from were the Sabines, and then there was a war about it after the Sabine War. The Sabine incident worked out really well for Rome, and Rome prospered because of this abduction. And that's why we Romans, Plutarch says, uh, commemorate this happy occasion. So I, I don't have too much else to say about that. Now we get a little bit of reassurance for the bride. Your man is not fickle, given to adultery, pursuing foul deeds, fleeing to lie away from your tender breasts. Just as slowly a vine wraps around nearby trees, he will be enfolded in your embrace. But the day's leaving. Go forth, new bride. Now we get into the more directly sexual content. O oh bed, witch for all... Uh, just kidding, we're missing three lines. But he continues. At the foot of the bright marriage bed where you come to your lord, how much joy, what a wandering night, what joy in the middle of the day. And then he repeats, but the day is leaving, go forth, new bride. So now we kind of go back in time a little bit. Lift the torches, boys, I see the flammeum approaching. Go, sing together in meter. O hymen, hymenae, yo, o hymen, hymenae. 
So the flameum, again, that's the veil. So the narrator, the singer, sees the veil coming, which means the bride is on her way, even though she was just already there. So we're playing with chronology here a little bit, doesn't really matter. She's going to come to the house and, you know, begin her life as a married woman. This section that we're about to get into refers to the custom of Fescaninus Iocatio, which we don't know too much about. The term itself translates roughly to Fescanine joke, and we don't know where that term comes from. This would have been some kind of song with dirty lyrics or dirty topics uh, that come up, dirty themes, and also a good amount of good-natured joking around and poking fun at people. I'll read you a good chunk of it. Don't let the bold Fescanine joking be silent for a long time, nor let his lover boy neglect the nuts for the boys when he hears about the abandoned love of his master. Don't let the bold ves Fescanine joking be silent for a long time. In other words, let's start singing it now. Nor let his lover boy neglect the nuts for the boys when he hears about the abandoned love of his master. So this song is talking about the groom and his male lover. The word here is concubinus, and I translated it as lover boy for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, I wanted to emphasize that this is a male lover Long story short, but relationships between Roman guys were not necessarily taboo. So I wanted to emphasize that, and I also wanted to preserve what it to me seems like an element of condescension with the word concubinus. Uh, we have the word concubine in English, we know what it means. It would have been something similar. Chances are this person, the concubinus, was probably enslaved um, and would have been, among other things, attending to the sexual needs of the dominus. This was not always the case, but this was the case sometimes. That was part of the duties of uh, domestic enslaved people. This is not necessarily referencing our specific groom in this poem, Manlius, it may just be generally part of the theme, because up until this point we haven't heard anything about him having somebody else. We know from later in the poem that he's like pretty nervous going into the consummation portion of the evening, so uh, it's possible that this is like not at all applying to him, but it would have been part of these kind of Fescanine songs. Nor let his lover boy neglect the nuts for the boys. So the nuts in question are probably walnuts, and they would have been tossed kind of like how people do a rice toss or something like that. Walnuts in particular were a symbol of fertility and also protection. You know, they have a hard outer shell, and nuts and seeds in general are great symbols for fertility for obvious reasons. So these would have been thrown and presumably the concubinus would have been in charge of holding on to them, at least that's what it sounds like here in these next few stanzas, um, and it's time now for him to hand over the nuts to the boys so that they can throw them, and the concubinus will be, as it says here, abandoned. And it repeats in the next stanza. Give the nuts to the boys, useless lover boy. Again, um, the word is inares. It's kind of like a a condescending kind of thing with, you know, concubinus as lover boy. You've played with the nuts long enough. Now it's right for you to serve Talasius. Lover boy, give them the nuts. I was so tempted by the line, you've played with nuts long enough. I really wanted it to be an innuendo. I can't find anything about it being an innuendo. Um, the word for played here is the verb ludo, ludere, which can mean play of any kind. And in fact, later in this poem, it is used in a sexual context, but I don't think there's anything here. If there is, and you know that this is a euphemism for something, please let me know in the comments. I would love for this to be a euphemism. I just don't think it is. Now it's right for you to serve Talasius. 
Okay, now we've reached another custom in the Roman wedding procession, and that is the cry of Talasio. And like every other thing I've talked about so far, we really don't know too much about it. There's a lot of interesting questions about the cry Talasio. Was it just the word Talasio that was cried out as kind of like a huzzah? Or was it a longer song like the Fescanine Yocatio and the title of it was Talasio? Was it maybe a chant? Uh, was there music? If it was a song, was it kind of like a prearranged choreographed song? Or was it like Happy Birthday where you just start and everybody joins in? We don't know the answers to any of these questions. We don't even know what the word Talasio means. Different writers spell it different ways. The only reference or possible etymology of it traces it again back to the Sabines, where theoretically one of the Romans who was taking part in this snatching of Sabine women was Talasius, and because he was, I don't know, their leader or something, uh, they, this is gross, I'm sorry, they like saved the choicest woman for him. Um, so Talasio could be a dative, which would mean uh, for Talasius or to Talasius. In other words, we've saved this one for Talasius. That's one possibility. It's not clear to me why the concubinus would have been expected to serve Talasius. It seems to me like what he should be doing is not serving Talasius anymore, but I'm not entirely sure why there's a connection there. Maybe just to reference this sort of cry or this chant or whatever it was. All right, moving on. Ladies used to disgust you, lover boy, today and yesterday. Now the hair curler shaves your face. Wretched, ah, oh, wretched lover boy, give them the nuts. He still has not given them over. Not too much to talk about here other than um, the reference to now the concubinus has to shave his face, which means that he has reached an age where he's starting to grow facial hair, which needs to be maintained. Um, and that is the signal of adulthood or one of the signals of adulthood. And another unfortunate reality is that Roman guys, freeborn Roman guys who took part in sexual activity with other guys, a lot of times preferred much younger guys, young boys, um, because they were more feminine. So that's what this is talking about. Just another day in ancient Rome. Now we turn to the husband. You will speak badly, husband, about abstaining from your perfumed, unbearded slaves, but abstain. Oh, hymen, hymenae, yo, oh, hymen, hymenae. So the new husband may not want to give up his male lovers who are young and unbearded, but he's going to have to. We know these things were allowed for you when you were known as a bachelor, but for a husband, those same things aren't allowed. Now, this is a lie. Despite the fact that in this video, and especially in the last video, I spent a lot of time talking about the very, very carefully guarded sexuality of girls and women, it was just not the same for guys. So not only would this new husband be expected to step outside of his marriage, expected in the sense that no one would have been surprised, but it was actually kind of encouraged. Not necessarily with the same concubinus, but there was no sense that a Roman man should limit himself sexually. Girls, yes, your job is to have one sexual partner and bear children, but for guys, go out and do whatever you're going to do. So this stanza is a lie, um, but it says something about the difference between the ideal and what actually happens in practice. Bride, you should also take care not to deny the things which your man seeks, nor let him go seeking elsewhere. 
O oh, let your house be powerful and blessed by your man, the house which works without you there. Until white old age, moving, shaking time, approves everything for everyone. Just kind of general hopes for a blessed household, one that is strong, one that produces, one that doesn't take a lot of work for you to produce, um, and that you live a long and happy life together. All right, now, now it gets interesting again. Carry golden feet across the threshold with a good omen and pass under the polished doorway. The golden feet here a reference to the potentially yellow or orange shoes that the bride would have worn. It's like every word of this stanza is so good. Carry the golden feet, her golden feet, across the threshold. Okay, the bride did not step into her new house, the house of her husband, on her own. Like today, although a lot of people don't do this anymore, but it is a tradition that you have certainly heard of, that the groom carries the bride over the threshold. We don't know why for some unknown reason. Well, I'm here to tell you this is the reason why, is because the ancient Romans did this. And they did it for several reasons, all of which are acutely interesting to me. Uh, when I say several reasons, I mean the Romans themselves didn't quite understand a lot of these wedding customs, but they had a lot of really good theories. One theory, as Catullus espouses here, carry golden feet across the threshold with a good omen. So, bear with me. The threshold is the entryway into your domestic space, which is itself symbolizing your family and your family life. Doorways and thresholds themselves are liminal spaces. You are passing from one kind of place to another kind of place. The Etruscans built their sanctuaries with a specific temenos, a boundary, to signify the difference between sacred space and secular or profane space. The Romans had this concept as well. They had a sacred boundary around the city called the pomerium. Everything inside the city was one way, everything outside the city was another way. The Romans had gods of doorways, thresholds, doorknobs, all of these different aspects of this liminal area. So it would have been very important for the activities in this one very special part of the house to, you know, make sure that everything goes very well. Otherwise, it might be a bad omen. So if the bride trips or accidentally kicks the threshold, that might signify bad luck and a bad start to the marriage. The domestic space was sacred to Vesta, which would have been of special interest to the bride up until this point, because again, she is supposed to be a weirgo, uh, which is a very Vestal thing to be. When you're entering into Vesta's house, into Vesta's space, it might be considered rude to kick her doorway, to kick this liminal space when she's inviting you in, or at least you hope she's inviting you in. You're coming in whether she brings you or not. So to avoid this kind of potential bad omen, we should just eliminate the possibility of the bride tripping or kicking the doorway by having her carried across it instead. Not necessarily even by the groom, it would have been some other member of the procession. Or it's another Sabine reference. When the Sabines were kidnapped, the men kind of, you know, chucked them over their shoulders and carried them into their houses to be their wives. Very romantic. All right, now we're back on the wedding night and the consummation of the marriage. See how your man lies alone on the Tyrian bed, entirely waiting for you. For him, no less than for you, a flame burns deep in his chest, but more deep. So he's more into it than you are. The reason we call this particular part of a wedding night, the consummation, is because it is literally the con summa. The summa is the summit or the kind of the peak of the event, which in this case would have meant like the whole reason why we're here um, is so that these two can start 
producing future Romans. Let go of the tender arm of the little girl, boy. So this boy would have been whoever carried her across the threshold. Again, we get this yucky word puelula. I don't know. It, it's just like a weird time to use it. It can't be an accident. He does it again in the next stanza. So let go of the tender arm of the little girl boy. Now she approaches her husband's bed. Oh, good women known well to old husbands come together with the little girl. So lots of encouragement from the community, apparently. But again, puelula, back to back. He's using it even more when we get to the point of the consummation, which just extra yucky, extra grosses me out. I'm sure there is like a better way for me to be looking at this, but I can't get past this word. Now it's allowed for you to approach, husband. Your wife is in your bed, shining with floored face, just like a white poppy. But husband, thus the celestial ones aid me, you are by no means less handsome. Venus hasn't neglected you. So he's trying to give the kid some courage, I guess. But the day is leaving. Go on, don't delay. You haven't delayed long, now you approach. Okay, that was very quick. Good Venus aids you since what you desire, you desire openly and you don't conceal good love. Uh, this word here, just the adjective, Bonus a-um, it's a generic good. It can mean good in pretty much any context. I think here it means upstanding. It means appropriate. It means um, acceptable because now their marriage uh, means that any sort of consummation that they have is going to be proper, whatever that means. Now we get a little mystical. Uh, this is one of my favorite stanzas. So simple and so packed full of goodness. He would sooner count the sands of Africa combined with the number of stars who would want to count your many thousand joys. So this is kind of a generic he. He would sooner count the sands of Africa combined with the number of stars who would want to count your many thousand joys. It's deceptively simple. Catullus, specifically, and Romans, generally, were really into numerology. And not just numerology, but they believed that data about a person could be used against them. So, if you'll bear with me here. Me again. I realized as I was editing this that I don't really want to talk too much about the specifics of numerology just yet because I actually want to treat this in a larger video that I'm going to put together and hopefully put out next month, so stay tuned for that. Um, but otherwise, suffice it to say that if you know the specifics of a number that is related to a person, be that a birthday or any relevant number, then you can use that against them and that is where you get people trying to kind of keep these numbers to themselves and hide the numbers. Here we have him again in Catullus 61, talking about many thousand joys and talking about if anyone was going to try and figure out that exact number of joys. Now, all of this is, of course, impossible and poetic, but bear with me, bear with Catullus. If someone were to try and calculate the exact number of joys that this couple has together, it would be greater than all of the sands of Africa and the number of the stars. Meaning, one, I hope you have a very happy life together, and two, it is impossible for someone to figure out, it, not even just impossible, it's impractical for someone to try to figure out the number of joys that you're gonna have. So yeah, a little bit of nifty numerology here in the midst of all of this. Um, but then we go right back to where we just were. Play as you please and soon give her children. It isn't right for so old a name to be without children, but it should always produce from the same place. So play as you please, this is the same verb ludo ludere as we had earlier in reference to the concubinus playing with the nuts, which is unfortunately not an innuendo. Um, so play as you please and soon give her children. 
It isn't right for so old a name. In other words, for someone like you, Manlius, who comes from such an illustrious family, uh, to be without children. It should always produce from the same place. So you should always have descendants from this aristocratic family because, you know, carrying on your name is going to be really important. I wish for little Torquatus to stretch out his tender hands on his mother's lap and laugh sweetly at his father with his mouth half open. Let your Manlius be like his father, right? So Manlius the groom at this wedding would have named his kid also Manlius. This is a family name, um, presumably. And easily let it be known by all who are ignorant and indicate his mother's modesty by his face. Such kind of praise esteems his good mother, just like fame endures for Penelope, the singular and best mother to Telemachus. So hope for future children, right? The consummation of the marriage is the end of the wedding. So the last hope that Catullus leaves them with, the, or the, that the narrator, the writer, leaves them with is hope for children that reflect the positive qualities of their parents, the bride and groom at this wedding. And then we just get a few more lines in conclusion. Close your mouths, virgins, we have played enough. But, good spouses, live well and attend to your duty continuously with youthful strength. So again, we get Ludo Ludere here for to play. Here we're talking about the joking around and the singing and the chanting that would have been happening. And then he leaves them with the sentiment, you know, live well, attend to your duty continuously with youthful strength. And that's the end of Catullus 61. So where's the wedding ceremony? Did you notice that there was no actual wedding ceremony? There's very little reference to anything ceremonial that would have happened, and any reference that we do have is not at all standardized. We have these like vague references to maybe touching fire and water as a purification ritual, but whether that was the bride or the groom, whether she did that at her house or the groom did it at his house, they did it together, it's unclear. If you look at archaeological evidence, you get what is called the dextrarum unctio, uh, which is a clasping of hands, the... Uh, dextra is the right hand, unctio, like a joining or a connection, like junction. This could have been an official kind of handshake of marriage, I guess. We don't have a lot of context for it because we only have the visual representation as opposed to having a written source for this, um, but this could have been the equivalent of a ceremony. We just don't know. It could have just been the signing of the paperwork, the dowry paperwork and everything. Um, but again, who knows? Um, so yeah, that, that's an interesting thing that we don't have the answer to. Where was the ceremony, if there even was one, and when did it happen in relation to the other events? The primary portion of the wedding would have been this great, super fun procession uh, that culminated with potentially an abduction pageant, boo, and uh, then, you know, the, the consummation of the marriage. That would have been the primary um, element, or those would have been the primary elements of this special day. So the bride gets ready at her house. The groom doesn't really have too much to do. He doesn't have a special costume or anything. And then they go from one house to the other, and that's kind of it. Uh, so weddings were definitely not uniform, definitely not standardized. There were things that were popular, and there was a lot of free choice, uh, at least for the families to kind of hash out together how the day was going to go. So Roman weddings are probably a little bit different from any wedding that you have attended, or your own wedding. It's certainly different than my wedding is going to be. Although I will be incorporating some Roman wedding customs into my own wedding. 
If you'd like to know what those are, you can stay tuned for the next video in the series, which is probably gonna be the last video, and that is talking all about what Roman customs I am using in my wedding and which ones I'm avoiding. Although you can probably already guess which ones I'm avoiding. So if you wanna know more about that, stay tuned. I will be putting that video out soon. And otherwise, that's all I have for you today. I hope that you found this helpful and I hope that you uh, learned something about the differences between ancient Rome and our own culture. If you did find this video helpful, if you did like it, you can let me know by leaving a thumbs up down below or saying something in the comments. The comment section is always so wonderful. If you haven't seen the video about Roman brides already, again, check it out down below. And otherwise, I just wanna say thank you as always for watching. I really appreciate you. You guys are great. And I will see you in the next video.